Hi, I'm Rebecca Henderson, and you're about to watch my film, Running With My Girls, on YouTube. We want to hear from you. Join the conversation using the hashtag RunningWithMyGirls. When a few of my homegirls decided to run for office, I started making a documentary about their experience. Five women in Denver band together to take on the political establishment. In Denver's 160-year history, we've never had a woman for mayor. It was actually more terrifying to decide to run than to think about being mayor. We want a country that we can be happy to pass on to our children and our grandchildren. Running With My Girls on America Reframed. Why do you think it's important to have representation in politics for women of color? Or do you think it's important? Yeah, I absolutely think it's important to have representation um, in politics, so particularly Black women. I think we learn about the world through different experiences and contexts, and, and bringing that to a policy lens I think is really, really important. Otherwise, you miss these opportunities to address things like systemic racism and structural oppression because you don't have folks who have been really close to the pain making policy decisions and being at the table with policymakers. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I now call to order the Tuesday, January 8, 2019, RTD special board meeting. Please, you are recognized, Director Lewis. Anytime I have a no vote, I'd like for you all to know the reason why I'm voting no for this. And I think it's really important that if we're truly advocating for our most marginalized communities, that we start by ensuring that we are banking with folks who value our communities, value our low-income communities, and aren't conducting shady business. More often than not, am I the only one to vote no on something? We had a conversation recently in RTD where we were talking about security officers on buses and trains, and someone says, we should get more security officers, to which someone responds and says, yeah, we can pilot those things. Me, like, oh, here we go. Gotta be the black girl to say. So, my community feels very much over-policed, and so if you're going to have that conversation about adding more security officers on buses or rail, I would ask that you don't pilot that in my community and we have a conversation before. And it gets exhausting always being that person to say that thing all the time. All votes have been cast and the record reflects that we have 14 directors in favor, one director opposed, that is Director Lewis. Uh, that motion passes. And if a woman of color asked me if she should run for office, I would absolutely say yes. We're like, please run for those who can or don't think they can. I'm trying to film her and myself <laughs> while, while canvassing. And um, it's kind of amazing, though. I, I this is. It's all DIY. It is. It is. It's all DIY. 
That's the words of the day. Oh, I look good though. I've always thought of myself as a good citizen. I cared about my neighbors and the environment. I volunteered. I worked in underserved communities. I voted most of the time. Don't check my record. But I didn't really pay attention, especially to my local government. If they were in my party, and if they were black, brown, or some variation thereof, they got my vote. I've lived in Denver for eight years, and I've always said it's not as dope as people think, especially if you're not white. My husband and I are both mixed race, black and white, but it seemed like a good place to raise our son since he came out white anyway. And Denver has a black mayor. How bad can it be? When a few of my homegirls decided to run for office, I quit my job, bought a camera, and started making a documentary about their experience. My husband was thrilled. <laughs> Pretty quickly, it became clear that this is not as simple as it seems. It started off really fun and really exciting. Chantel was the first to run and she won. She knocked doors, she got the community involved, she showed us how it was done and she made it look easy. But over the next year of filming, Chantel's win proved to be the exception instead of the role. Okay, so we're here, we're at um, campaign headquarters with campaign Candy C. Welcome, welcome. All, All this things stuff. Candy. Yeah. We have 11,000 pieces of literature in my car. This is a campaign car. Do you have like a regular canvassing schedule? Every day. Wow. This is Candy from the Block, AKA Candy C. DeBaca, and her race is historic. She's running as the first LGBTQ Latina to serve on Denver City Council. Candy's activist roots go back to her days as a high school student. As class president and valedictorian, she led a successful legal battle against the district over failed school reforms. At the age of 18, she and Chantel Lewis founded the nonprofit Project Voice to empower other young people to fight for justice in their communities. After we got Project Voice started and after I finished my master's, I moved out to DC for a summer fellowship. It was right after Obama had been elected. So when I got out there, I was just electrified by the energy of young people of color from all over the country concentrating themselves in that one space and trying to change the world together. I turned that four months into six years. Candy moved home in 2014 and realized that the neighborhood her family had lived in for four generations was quickly disappearing under a city government controlled by developers. Denver is one of the fastest gentrifying cities in the country, second only to San Francisco. Over the last 10 years, home prices have nearly doubled. Rents have risen dramatically. Denver is no longer an affordable city, especially for black and brown families. And Candy's district has been hit the hardest by these rapid changes. Across the alley from where I live, the rent was $400. Go over there now, three years later, it's $2,000. All yes. they did was oh. paint it. You're doing it, you're doing it. Stuff like this, and pull the people out, and then you turn around, and then you go, well, you know what? We got a lot of homeless people out here. Well, why don't you work on that? They are slowly and quietly confusing people to think the city council and the mayor is doing great for this city. They're this is Colorado Matters from CPR News. I'm Ryan Warner. A Denver coffee shop remains in hot water after placing a sign out front that read happily gentrifying the neighborhood since 2014. Protests erupted after people in the historically black Five Points neighborhood caught wind of it. As much as people like to tell that gentrification improves the area, gives us something nice, we know that Research shows that the overall net benefit to communities is negative. In our communities, we keep talking about it as a race issue. But like I said, this is class warfare. Gentrification is about being able to have the capital to displace people who cannot afford to stay. That protest we organized over text over a day, and we had hundreds of people come out we started to recognize that we had some power to activate people around the issues. 
we're letting our politicians shape the city that they want, that they can profit off of. We have to take back our city. And people I did an interview on the phone with the news reporter, and I was so mad, and I got off the phone, and my niece was like, Thea, if you're so mad, why don't you just run? And, you know, I, I sat there for a minute in the car, and I was like, this is a sign. This is a sign. And so I turned around, printed out the form, got my bank to notarize it, and filed my papers that day on my lunch break with my niece. We're gonna drive by a sign. It's gonna blow your mind how big it is. It's kind of awesome. Hold on, keep your eyes out. Oh my God. Candy. Isn't that crazy? Yes! Who made that? Did you guys do that? The people who own this building did. Ain't that crazy? They love you. What's funny about this race is that I don't know how much of people supporting me is love for me or hatred for Albus. Mm. Because he's a, he's a hated character. Can we talk about that for a minute? Because I don't, again, what I always say, I'm an outsider. Mm -hmm. I don't know these people. When I looked at Denver and I saw you had all these black people on your government, right? Because I'm not from here. I was like, oh good, I could live here. Look at all these black people. Optics would suggest that this is a city that cares about black and brown people. Um, I think we've upheld that facade for quite a while as a city. When I became mayor, this city was in trouble financially. We had almost a double digit <laughs> unemployment rate in this city. And the reality is that investment wasn't coming and there wasn't a vision for moving the city forward. Fast forward seven and a half years later, this has become the most desirable city in the country, <clears throat> illustrated by the number of people who moved here, 110,000 people in the last 10 years. These people aren't stupid. They know that we're hurting in this city. It doesn't matter that we have a black mayor. They're still hurting in this city. So, you know, for him to keep saying, you know, all of this economic prosperity we have full, employment. Well, slavery was also full employment, and that didn't help us. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Never mind the cameras. Lisa is my favorite girl. I'm not really her favorite because I talk too much, but she's amazing. This woman has a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a law degree, and a doctorate in education. She's also a social justice advocate who has spent most of her career standing up for victims of domestic abuse and sexual harassment. So when news broke in 2018 that Denver Mayor Michael Hancock had sent inappropriate texts to a female police officer on his security team, Lisa took to the Capitol steps to demand accountability. I watched how Michael Hancock, the mayor of our city, told voters that his conduct did not rise to the level of sexual harassment and heard the outrage that a man in the highest office in the city would not be held accountable for his actions. And then to see the city council also buckle under pressure from the mayor's office and the city attorney's office. And it came to me that no one was going to hold him accountable in the halls of power. Through a lot of soul searching and thinking, I don't want to give up my privacy. On the other hand, I had to think of what would be worse. And what is worse is not having a voice in the future direction of this city. Are we giving those out? Yeah, aren't they awesome? <laughs> In Denver's 160-year history, we've never had a woman for mayor. For those who don't think that that matters, it absolutely should matter. Representation matters. I am proud today to introduce Dr. Lisa Calderon. Today, I stand before you as a native-born daughter of this city, a mother, a worker, a community leader, an educator, to formally declare my candidacy to become the first woman mayor of the great city of Denver. You 
you know, being brought up with my mother, who is an activist in the Chicano movement, I learned how to really rely on mentors. And so having tough talking women who were like, we will take on any man, that was, you know, my modeling. And so Veronica was just fierce and I just loved her for it. Good morning, Veronica. How are you, my darling? Veronica Varela. Honestly, I could make a whole film about all the work this legend has done. She was intersectional before it was even a word. Veronica served as president and CEO of the Community Development Corporation NUSED for 40 years. She championed affordable housing, local business development, and cultural celebrations in Denver's historically Latinx community. Go ask the majority of Latina and Latino leaders where they got their origin, who mentored them, and what organizational foundation do they come out of? And I guarantee you it's gonna point back to Veronica Barella. Here's somebody who has been there every step of the way. You're gonna see a Cinco de Mayo celebration, which is the largest in the country. I remember when it was an idea of activists, but look at it today, the largest in the country. Who's behind that? Veronica Barella. I feel really honored to be grand marshaling the event I started many years ago. Have you ever been the grand marshal before? No. This is your first time? This is my Let me shoot. Uh, okay. I didn't know it was your first time. Well, usually you ask, you know, like mayors and governors and, you know, politicians to grand marshal. Now that I retired from New City, I can grand marshal it now. And maybe I'll be a politician soon. While Candy's district is deep in its fight against gentrification, Veronica's community is worried that they're next. I was born and raised in La Amelie Lincoln Park, and Thatcher also, my husband also grew up in, in La Amelie Lincoln Park. So we've known each other since we were kids. That's why I act the way I do. <laughs> but uh, District 3 is interesting because it's the highest poverty rate in the city. So when you look at maps like with the health and hospitals or you know, where it's prime for gentrification. You know, this area is always the darkest color. They put these uh, square houses in, and these square houses are very expensive. I was taught that success was to leave my neighborhood. It wasn't until I left Denver that I realized that the whole point of teaching us success is to get out is to leave our spaces vulnerable for takeover. The Sorry east side is officially gentrified. There is a man jogging down Welton. That, that is the for show. I tell, I mean to tell you, I ain't never in the history of my life, and I've been in Denver my whole life. Mm -mm. Right? I never see nobody jogging down well that wasn't wait. running from a no no dog. He stopped. He stopped. Maybe because there were black people here. No, he didn't no. stop. He, he tired. Stopped. Oh, he stopped. <laughs> <laughs> He's from uh, Seattle. Hey, you saw this altitude. He about to bust open. Shayla Richard is my homegirl, homegirl. She always shows up and she has the biggest heart. She's a single mom and a black woman in tech, so you know she's used to pointing out issues of inequity when others won't. Shayla's district is on the outskirts of Denver, also known as the far Northeast, and was originally built as affordable housing for black and brown city workers. Her neighborhood, Montbello, definitely suffers from a lack of investment by the city, and developers increasingly have their eyes on it for takeover. And Shayla is not having it. Our poverty rate is four times our employment rate, then that tells us we're the working poor. Right. Right. That number I don't know when I came involved in politics because my life has always been political. I was born black and I was born a woman and I was born a black woman in America. So my very existence is political. I think I've always kind of had a sense of that. I come from a family that is very knowledgeable and that has always been involved, maybe not necessarily running for office, but just in terms of being informed. 
Shayla, I met her through a friend and was able to build a relationship with her prior to deciding to run. I'm gonna blame Candy C. Tabaka. It's Candy's fault. No, um, I went to see her after she'd announced and I was so excited for her. And um, she said, well, sister, you need to run in 11. I'm like, no, I don't wanna run in 11. I, I just wanna work and take care of my son. I just finished coding school and I was like, hmm, no. I don't think I want to do that. And I kept thinking about it for a few more weeks, like, what would that look like? What would, what would all that be about? What would happen with that? And one Friday night in May, like the first week of May, I was laying in bed chilling because I like to chill. And something just, I heard a voice that just said, do it, do it. What I want to know, though, is why are you running against it? Like, what's Stacey Gilmore's deal? This whole project has been like a learning experience for me, too. I just don't know. Stacey is a good council person for a few people. Stacey's good for a smaller percentage of individuals in, in District 11, opposed to a good council person for the majority. She wasn't a co-sponsor on a bill that directly affects people of color, and yet you represent a district that has the highest percentage of people of color outside of District 3. Your focus is on building and developing things that people can't afford that your current citizens don't have access to. So you're trying to attract a certain population and you're alienating others, mm. but you still aren't interested in keeping us safe. Who has to get hurt for it to matter? Yeah. Because it's not our little black and brown kids. Somebody white got to come out there and get before you decide, oh, this is what you got to do. Yeah, I hear you. You know I do. So I've decided I'm sick of that and I'm going to go ahead and go went across the street, find my papers. That was free. That was free. I was right there. That was free. The government and very savvy politicians really depend on and they count on the disenfranchisement and the apathy of this neighborhood. Like, they count on you not to know. They count on you not to be curious to find out. They count on your ignorance and they depend on your ignorance because when you're ignorant to what's going on, oh, they can pass so many things over you because your head's been down and you've been working and grinding and raising your kids the whole time. The reason why we're not getting what we're supposed to be getting is because there's not enough of us saying this is wrong. If you look around the country and you look at Denver, you start seeing folks who are elected that have no connection to the communities historically that sent them to office. Women particularly are seeing this and they're taking on mainstream politics and they're running without permission and they're running without the handshake and they're running without the backing. Look at their backgrounds. They're not political science majors. They're not party people. They're not individuals that are super funded. They are grassroots individuals who have looked at the political landscape and said, I can't take this anymore. People need to understand how all of our struggles are connected to each other. And I think that we live in a world that tries to make us feel like all of our fights are separate and mm -hmm. it's one or the other. And you have to pick your issue and you have to pick your lane. We are products of divide and conquer. We're taught that if we don't get it, someone else will. There were so many points throughout our campaign that people tried to pull us apart people internal working on our campaigns who were saying, you need to cut it loose. Like, you cannot be helping Lisa and Shayla. There was even a point where we had an individual who was helping me at an extremely discounted rate. Me and my partner, we were just like, Shayla needs a campaign manager. Let Shayla have the campaign manager so that she can at least get started. Lisa saw a point where I didn't have a campaign office and she was like, you can share the campaign office. There were points where I was taking all of my lit with me and taking all of their lit with me and my car was full of all of our stuff together. Other campaigns charge to do that kind of thing. They charge each other to do those things. In addition to that, we can also get folks who give whatever they can. Nothing is wasted. We use One of the wildest things I discovered on my political learning journey was that it's not just about qualifications or experience or likability. 
what it's really about is money, lots of money. Even our low cost, high impact campaign, we still have to get things printed and get the message out. And it's expensive to do that. Like so much money. Hey Jeff, what are you doing? We're trying to make a funding deadline by tomorrow. So, oh my gosh, you're amazing. Yes, you can do it right now with me. If someone were to tell you before you ran for office that you spend most of your time raising money, I can see why a lot of people would be turned off. I did not know that. I wanna be out there with the people. I wanna be developing policy. I want to have more forums and debates. And yet I've been told from the beginning, you need to spend most of your time raising money. Good evening. Joining us for the next 60 minutes are the six candidates who want the job of mayor of Denver. Lisa Calderon, Stephen Seku Evans, Jamie Gillis, Michael Hancock, our current mayor, Kaylin Rose Heffernan, and Penfield Tate. For me, this election is really focused on creating a livable Denver. It's the so we looked at the money that people are raising and one of your opponents, Jamie Gellis, she has so much money mm -hmm. and it's all LLCs giving at the maximum, all with like names that are like variations of Zeppelin or something. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about that that you could talk about? <laughs> or? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a challenge that women of color who are running face, and that is money that is from corporations and developers. So right now, not only do I have to go up against an incumbent who has over a million dollars in the bank easily because they're just throwing money at him, but I'm also going up against someone who is a relative newcomer in our community, isn't as qualified as me in terms of knowing the community, knowing the issues, and yet, just by the amount of money she has, she's deemed viable. And I think that there's something incredibly wrong with the system that we judge someone's viability based on how much money is thrown at them, even though most of her money comes from essentially three people, their businesses and their family members. How much money do you need? How much money do I need? I don't know. Because Your it- campaign <laughs> manager's here. How much money does she need? She needs about, to run the rest of the race, about 15 grand. 15 grand, that's what you need? That's what I need. So far, I think I might have, I've raised 3,000, but I've probably spent about 1,500 so far. And, wait, this is, hold on. Hello, this is a collect call from. Oh, Ashton in jail. Because I literally have like a film crew in my house. I'm giving, I was given an interview. All right, live your life. What happened? You don't know. Yeah, this is a bunch of boys, a bunch of gibberish, which means it's not real. Does he want you to come get him out? I'm, I don't go get Ashton out of jail. I don't do jail. I don't do it. Well, I have jumped in and tried to do everything that I could for him since he was born. I named him. I pulled him out of my mother. So he's going to do what he's going to do. I can't prevent it. I can't stop it. There's nothing I can do. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. Because every time I try to do something, for myself, he smells it. For me, taking the risk to do this because I know that life is fleeting and life is short, there are no guarantees. But also just doing something selfishly because I've always delayed everything else in my life for other people. Excuse me, excuse me. 
When I was growing up and in school, always being deeply invested in my studies, what I was doing was overcompensating for what was happening in my home life, for what we were dealing with when we didn't have gas and light or when we didn't have food. It was my way of putting on that facade so that people wouldn't judge me because of that, so that I wouldn't get a different level of investment from my teachers because of that. And it worked for me for so long, you know, I was able to just carry our family forward by pushing through at whatever cost. And I feel like I'm in that exact same situation again because I'm like reliving a pattern that I'm very accustomed to. And it's a survival pattern. I mean, I think about my mother and my father sitting in the seat. My father's in prison and his daughter's running for counsel. That's a big deal. You know, even at a young age, we knew that we were restricted by race and poverty, just in terms of how the external world would treat us at times. My mother is Mexican, very large family. My father is African-American, and my father lived a life that was very fast. He had a lot of demons that he was trying to stay ahead of. And as a result of those demons, he was a alcoholic and was violent toward the women in his life. A lot of times you grow up thinking that that's normal, that this is what is expected of girls and women. This is just our plight in life. I remember walking into the kitchen, living in the projects one day, and my mother was sitting on the floor um, uh, in a pool of blood. Um, she had been stabbed in the leg by one of her abusive boyfriends. At 17 years old, I was put out of my house from an abusive stepfather and went into the household of an abusive man who was my partner. And that experience was incredibly brutal because I also experienced homelessness. A lot of it is stuff that you can't easily correct without help, right? So it took me meeting other people. It took me going to therapy. It took me understanding intellectually how poverty affects people, how abuse affects people, to be able to push my life in a different direction. But yes, my mom was a single mom. We did grow up on public assistance. My mom had mental health issues. She was abusive. I ended up in an abusive relationship. I escaped that relationship. All of those things were just part of getting me to where I am now. I was raised from a deficit. And when you're raised from a deficit, there is a skill set and a resilience and a grit that you are given that other kids don't have. It teaches you to put things into perspective about really, you know, what is worth fighting for, what is worth surviving for, and, and thriving for, because it's not just about me, it's also about inspiring lots of other people. I know, that's what I'm trying to find out. Sheila's out. She's what out? What do you mean? What? She's out. It's very embarrassing to work so hard for something and you know, you're know you out there and you're running your mouth, right? I mean, cause you are, you're running your mouth and you're, you're, call, you're pointing out, you know, the mistakes of the incumbents and of, you know, you're doing all this, right? You're pointing fingers, right? You're doing this. And then one of the most seemingly easiest things to do, to execute, right? Get signatures and get your on the ballot, right? That's supposed to be the easiest thing you do. And that was the one thing that I didn't execute. I want to ask why you feel like that was on you, because in my understanding, that is something that a campaign manager could definitely... Right, and, and very, I think, 
I own it because even at the end of the day, she is someone that I chose and paid to work with me. I feel really guilty now because even though I know that that's the right way for us to run together, I did not realize how hard it would be for all of us to staff these campaigns and to really find high quality people willing to support us. My biggest fear, I keep telling people, is really not losing. My biggest fear is winning alone. At every turn in my life, I've had to make these really tough decisions that feel like I'm leaving community and friends and peers behind, but it's really about if I don't go forward, there's not gonna be anybody to pull them with me. What up, Thatcher? Can we come in? Can you come in? Yeah. Come on in. Bienvenidos a la casa de Varela. All right, what do we got here? Here's my ballot. Yes. <gasps> you got, you're doing your ballot? Yes, queen. I can't believe I'm here for this. Veronica, how does it feel to vote for yourself? Feels wonderful. <laughs> Feels great. At least I know I got my vote. <laughs> Thatcher, who did you vote for? I voted for the lady of the hour in the day and the night. No, I bet against this. <laughs> he's been my champion about flyering. By himself, I bet he's hit, I don't know, 3,000 doors. Easy. Yeah. And uh, today he was talking to about three different people. They said they voted for me. Then he hit this one. And, he, and when you ask him, Did, can I ask you who you voted for? And they say, nope. <laughs> you know they didn't vote for you. Oh, and what I want to do is organize people in corners with my signs. I don't have any signs. I'm going to have to pull them up out of the arts. Happy election day. Happy election day. Happy election day, mom. All right, I got my Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez red lipstick on, and I am about to get on down to Brother Jeff's Cultural Center for the seminal moment of the film, hopefully. Today's the day. It's election day. eight people in a row that voted for you on the text messages. That's really good to hear. Jeez. We're gonna do it. Since we're right here, it's gonna just show up. So we probably could just do maybe 10 minutes at the most, and then we gotta like pack up and run to Univision. You're invited to join. Okay, we're ready. It was actually more terrifying to decide to run than to think about being mayor. Connecting. I'm like, ah, I can handle that. But just just getting over that threshold to say, are you willing to put yourself out there, expose yourself, all of the stuff that comes with it. Lisa, tell us a little bit about you, your background, and what brought you to be a mayoral candidate. Hi, just check in to see if you voted today or if you need a ride to the polls or if you want to drop your ballot off. I don't have none of that. None of that? You don't want to vote? Question, have you voted today? I don't want to vote. Why? No, I just got home from work and I really don't want to be bound to it, ma'am. Okay, thank you. The few people that are saying that they did vote, they're saying that they, they got their ballots picked up by someone from the Hancock administration or someone from the Brooks administration, and so. I'm not surprised, though, because people who are from a generation where just having someone who looked like you was enough. That's that yeah, that's all that mattered. That screwed us over so Exactly. You know, I've spent my life leading horses to water. In a family like mine, you get used to people just not taking that step themselves. And so I'm prepared mentally for people to not vote, to not show up. But I hope they do. I hope they do. Okay, where are we going now? Office. Office. Yep. Yay! Hi, Jade. This is Caitlin Carter. Hi, Jade. Hi, Caitlin. 
calling Dr. Lisa Calderon for Denver Mayor's campaign and notice that you have not. I don't have expectations really anymore. Instead, I'm just like, hey, I'm just glad to be in the fight. I'm glad that people are out there canvassing, calling. We're doing everything we possibly can. And at a certain point, then it's out of my hands. Thank you so much for your support for Candy. Have a great day. Candy, see the box campaign. I just want to make sure you got a chance to vote. Two hours to vote. It's all good. Please This is like the most I've ever seen you eat, by the way. <laughs> all right, Savannah, here is your ballot to hold on to. Filling out my ballot with my name. <laughs> I'm glad I get to vote for candy. Okay. Hi, this is Elizabeth, your neighbor, calling on behalf of Candy City Baca, who's running for city council here in Denver District 9. That's hilarious. I had no idea. I call, I phone banked Lisa's daughter. Oh, hey, Savannah. Oh, hey, Savannah. <laughs> when are you going to be down here, sister? We're going to go over there. We're going to head over there at 645. Okay. Okay. We're, we're just getting here. All right, we'll see you there. Okay, bye. This candy calling. She's still working it. It's um, 6.22 p.m., and I'm following behind Candy and Carrie. So far, in case anyone wants to know, like, what I've learned from working on this film thus far, is that politics is not easy. Running these so-called little races is so much money. It's designed to keep marginalized people in the margins. I want things to be different in this city. Is it raining real hard? I think it's yeah. coming and going, coming and going. Okay. I guess I don't have to take anything out. I'm used to taking a whole bag full of stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. this came into my mailbox all of these people wanted to have your vote did you give it to them or are you going to toss that ballot in the morning just like you tossed uh the rest of this stuff that's in the pile six minutes until you become a council person I'm so scared. No, don't. oh god where's lisa I'm gonna throw up, I'm gonna throw up. Breathe. Candy has arrived. How are you doing? I'm scared. Yeah, you've done everything you can. You've done everything you can. And one way or another, we are going to change this city. You know, transitions are the most dangerous time, but they're also the most powerful time. And I think you're being hit with both of those. Right? But I'm so grateful we're going through this together. I'd be terrified alone. We just need that little margin of victory. We are going to see that tonight in a few minutes. This is like the first round. OK. Hancock, 39.89. Jamie, 26.54, with 25,000 votes. Uh, Lisa at 15,000, third. Penfield's 14,000. Okay. Fourth. Jamie Gillis, 25,000 votes. Uh-oh. Now you know I'm rolling with Dr. Lisa Calderon. Um, it's not over. Is anything up yet for candies? Um, charges, can we pull it up? <laughs> well, you are we're close, not so no, we're you're close. The first, third, though, we're right in the away, first, right? Yes. So we got, we got time. So that's a runoff. Yeah, he doesn't get 50. The one to watch right now, everybody, Council District Number 9. If no one gets 50% plus one, it's going to a runoff. Councilman Brooks, he's sweating bullets right now. He he ain't showing up at his party. Looks like Candy's gonna run off. Yes. Dallas Brooks. Oh my gosh. Uh, I'm gonna call him 
District number three. Veronica Barella, 38%. Jamie Torres, 37%. Those two are battling it out. Wow. The 830 numbers are in. And Mayor Hancock's numbers have gone up from 38 to 39,000. Jamie Gillis is at 26%. Lisa Calderon is at 16%. Penfield Tate is at 14%. If you are a Jamie Gillis supporter, you are happy. It's going to a runoff. So I'm expecting to be in a runoff. I don't think the ballots that came in from this morning will, will put me over 51%, or 50. What is it, 51%? 50 plus one vote. 50 plus, wow. That's amazing. So anyway, I'm, I'm not expecting It's possible. It. It's, it's po possible. Anything's possible. Anything is possible. So the person... He's not going to get 50%. You're already in a runoff. He will not win. Okay. Okay. This is... So proud of you. Hard, man. It sucks. Well, you know, if it was easy, we'd have the incumbent. <laughs> Y'all got another three and a half weeks? Yeah, that's right. You do. You do. Of course you do. Uh, I'm using my mama voice now. <laughs> you do. Y you do. <laughs> I have to. You have come too far, oh, and and this last leg is not about him. It's about the community. Mm -hmm. You if focus we... on the community, you will get your strength, mm -hmm. and you will run with it. It's not about him anymore. for being here. Over a year ago, when we protested the ink coffee, we said at that time that things are not going to change unless we elect new leadership. And we heeded the call that you all had for us to run for office. Are we going to win? When you do a campaign, that's the first question, right? But even if that question is uncertain, the next question is, can we build power? Yeah. And I think what we have proven tonight is that we have built power across this city. We have at least two progressive candidates who are headed for the runoff, Veronica Barella and Candy Sedevaca. When we entered this race, we didn't expect it to be easy. This race would have been a slam dunk if we didn't stand with our community on the streets, if we didn't stand for the poor people in this city. I did not want to win alone, but over and over, the people I have run with, the community I have run for, has said, we know that at least one of us has to get through. That's right. That's right. Because if we don't get one, I don't know. I don't know how many of our families will be left in this community after four more years of what we've been under. And so I'm ready. I didn't want to fight for another 28 days. <laughs> I didn't, but I will dig deep and I will pull out what I need to pull to run for this. And we are still positioned for a runoff right now. We get the update and there was a late rush of ballots and they will be counting them for a while. Your next results are gonna come in at about 10 o'clock. One minute. Oh, here we go.
She pulled ahead by 40 votes. Forty votes. So okay, what does that mean moving forward? Same thing. Runoff. Here we go. Jamie, yes. Jamie's pulled ahead. but we fought a good fight. You all did work your hearts out. And we'll do it again. Yeah. You were great. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. All right, Ashley, great job. All right, we'll figure out what next, clean up, all of that stuff. So we're going home. I was not emotionally attached to winning or losing. Maybe it comes from being a longtime organizer and never expecting to win a battle, but you expect to fight and to strategize and to keep going. Social justice change is always incremental. You know, it's rare when it all of a sudden happens. You know, some people would want to like fantasize, like, what, what if you're mayor? What would you do? And I'm just like, reluctantly would talk with them, but that's not how I thought about stuff. I'm dealing with here and now, and I'm dealing with the strategy to get us from A to B. Give me the big smile and stand by and action. I'm Jamie Gillis. As mayor, I'll take action to rein in out of control growth in housing costs. Look right this in runoff here. part, hey, yeah, right? Jamie, look right can I just go ahead and say it sucks? Yeah. <laughs> it really is not my favorite thing right now. <laughs> so the night of the election, I reached out to both Penfield and Lisa and said that night, I would love to talk with you. I'd love to just sit. I know it's been a rough race. You know, initially I was not even thinking about endorsing Jamie Gillis. Wasn't even on my radar. I was like, okay, we ran our race, we're done. Um, but after she and I met, along with Penfield Tate, for it then became, am I gonna be able to live with myself if I didn't do everything I possibly could do to try to defeat someone who has a history of sexually harassing women, um, who didn't listen to the voices of folks of color who are being gentrified out of our communities at a record pace. We all got into this for one reason, and that was to take Michael Hancock out of office. Um, we may have agreed, we may have disagreed along the way, but there was, there was still that primary focus. You know, you go to war with the army that you have, not the army that you want. And that's what I did. We've come here today not to surrender our activism, not to be pushovers. We've come because we decided not to say we're going to sit this out. I understand that there's this mourning that had to happen. Like people really needed to express their sorrow around having someone that they wanted to vote for as opposed to someone who is a default and not that they were excited about. Like I totally got that. I couldn't process that with people because I was still in campaign mode. We love you, Lisa. A lot to me. We love you, Lisa. <laughs> 
convening today is not about Jamie or me or Penfield. It is about what is in the best interest of Denver. Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. <laughs> we have a new opportunity to write a new playbook and to have people come together. That's who will win this election. Is Ms. Gillis able to take questions? She'll be over in a moment. She just needs a little light here. Hello. May I come in? Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Hi, Hi Mamacita. How are you? Good. Are you recording me? Yes. I'm always recording. So I'm coming by to see how you guys are doing. We're good. We're just getting ourselves organized. So are they loading our list, or how do we do it? Let's get your phone out and put this in there. Should I give him that or Wes Colfax? Wes Colfax. Rock and roll. All right. You, did it I pull didn't up? mean Marley. I meant Yep, pull. that one worked. OK, cool. So who's going to get that other territory? You and I. Because we're the best talkers. OK, ready? A lot of people are working on Candy's campaign, but kind of ignoring my campaign. I don't know if that's true. I committed to helping her with an event she had on Friday. There was like less than 10 people there. People believe that she's only in support of Jamie Gillis. And the people that believe she should have been supporting oh, that's Hancock. To, yeah, yeah, that's happened to me left and right. So that's what I said. Keep me out of yeah. this, you know. I'm not telling who I'm supporting, you know. Yeah. I met with both of them. That's the way life is. Mm -hmm and don't push me to endorse either one of them. That's the way to live. I live from day to day. Ooh. Hey, Jason. Okay. I'm seeing you, honey. I got to go. Are you going to be glad when this is over? Oh, really? Yes, I'm going to be very glad when it's over. <clears throat> this has been very stressful. Are you open to the possibility of not winning? Yes. Like, how deeply do you think that will impact you? I think it's really going to deeply impact me. I worked so hard. We did everything we could to put out who I am and what I'm about in my experience. I guess what really bothers me is a couple of people put a lot of money in my campaign, mm -hmm. and that's going to be really devastating for me if I don't win. Don't beat yourself up for that. I mean, you know what I mean? I can't even share that. This is actually, in the way I see it, it's 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 really in a lot of ways payback for all you've given. Where's your phone? Again, for free. <laughs> and and so, damn right, they should be giving you money. I mean, in all campaigns, there's a winner and a loser, unfortunately, and I believe you're going to win. But if you don't, I know there's going to be this natural inclination to be like, people gave me a lot of money, but you didn't waste it. So, no. so don't ever think that. <clears throat> OK, thank you, honey. I'm ready, Anna. Three more days. Let's do it. <laughs> Runoffs are strategically built around the incumbent's ability to inject a lot of resources very quickly into a do or die situation. And so I knew that if we made it to the runoff, the runoff was going to be harder than the entire uh, time previous. And so I definitely had concern, but I knew that our community wanted something different. 55% of our district voted against the incumbent. Yes, I'm starting off behind, but I have an advantage here. 55% is a big deal, and we can take this. Oh my God, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you guys for tuning in. It's your host, Shay J on the Brother Jeff Network, Five Points News. Here with mayoral candidate runoff, Jamie Gillis. Yes. Let's show her some love. Yes. Thank you so Thank much for being here today. Do you know about the NAACP? Just clear it up for the people yes. that you know about the NAACP. Yes, absolutely. Okay. What does it mean? National African American. No. <laughs> You're gonna test me on this? Yeah. 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 Jamie Gillis for mayor? Like Trump, she called undocumented immigrants criminals. Yes, we won't tolerate crime or criminal activity. We will comply with authorities. We will comply with ICE. What does NAACP stand for? National African American. No. 
You're gonna test me on this? Now Jamie Gillis has deleted racially insensitive tweets to hide her past views. This isn't Denver. We are all Denver. I think she's a Republican who's voiced her opinion of what she thinks of minorities. How do we support her? Right. And she's actually not a Republican, because that was one but of the all, questions all that the I- All the things she says sound Republican to me, whether she, she's a blue dog. When I read the stuff she said, there's no way that I could put my efforts into going for her. And so the question becomes, do we go with someone who- I think who has, clearly- on the surface says she dislikes us. Well, she, but she's never said that, to no, be she's fair. She's never no. said that. But I understand that that's the impression. The impression she gives from the things she says are such. Like, Latinos are criminals. Which she also that never she said. Says. I think your critiques are fair. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm not here to defend her, because believe me, Rebecca knows. <laughs> right, yes, I'm right. the last one. Yeah. I know, I know. And what I'm trying to say is I, I need it to really move past these two um, bad options. Yes, there's things that she's said and done that we don't like, but when she says, I will have you on my transition team because I do have deficits, it means possibilities when we didn't have them with this guy. That's so. right. Man, Lisa, I can't believe she's doing this. I feel like I don't have the stomach for these politics, honestly. Don't have the stomach for it. Denver City Councilman Albus Brooks says a supporter contacted him this morning after finding flyers on cars near Curtis Park with his face on them. His face attached to the body of a monkey. Just disgusting, right? It has no place in our society. It was as offensive to me as it was to my opponent when I saw it. And I wasn't called about it. I found out because I logged into Facebook and had a notification where I was being accused of producing it by the mayor's director of public affairs. So to find out about it in that way, one, it was public, two, it was directly accusing me from a high level staff member on another campaign. It completely disregarded all of the work that I've been doing throughout my career. I have exclusively focused on racial justice and people knew that. It was my first real lesson in what desperation can look like when the power structure is crumbling. They had a very far reach and they had a lot of power to shape that narrative. You know, we talk in general about the power of money in elections, but I don't think people really absorb the power of money in elections. Because in the last week of the campaign, they were able to buy ads on every television station every five minutes that smeared me. And we didn't have enough money to combat that. So perception becomes reality. And so unfortunately, we were left in a responsive position. To sit there and say that, I think you need to acknowledge that you've made your own mistakes as well, and we, we learn through them every single day. Uh, just to clarify, Ms. Gillis is referring to text messages that you acknowledged sending in 2012 uh, to a police, uh, to a city employee. There was never a lawsuit against me. There was never a sexual harassment claim against me. Uh, and there's never been a settlement that was directly related to my actions. And the other thing is when you see the text from Detective Branch White, you see my text. Mayor, can you? No, no, no. You Hold, please. No, no, no. You don't see the reason why. That, that, the reason why I never said that it was sex. That's why. Reason why I say it was sexual harassment because you don't see the back and forth conversation that occurred. That's the point I said. And so that's all I ever said. Hold your applause, please. Sir. Sir. I really am most worried about truth not coming across in its complete form. And I am looking to community to make sure that we are reclaiming that narrative and really taking an active role in shaping it. So I'm Detective Leslie Branchwise, and as you all know, I worked in the mayor's unit um, for a short time um, before requesting to leave due to um, the culture that the mayor created um, while employed in his unit. Um, Leadership starts at the top, and I think when you have a mayor who blames the victim after sexually harassing uh, someone who is in the police and tasked with protecting him, and then you have a council that refuses to investigate that, 
you create and feed into a culture of toxic masculinity that puts women in jeopardy and danger every single time they step into work, especially when they're in those spaces in the department. We all came together as city council um, and looked at all the evidence before us. Now you have the evidence in front of you um, that Detective Lashley Bruce Wise said that she was not uh, sexually harassed through, through, through the affidavit. I so, think the cracks that we've created and the dominant power structure are significant. Show some time, show some class. Hey, 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 hey. Yeah, you're one to talk. Okay, okay, bro. You said she was a communist, bro. She never said was a communist. She never, how is that a communist statement? That's not a communist. How is that a communist statement? So if you can use that, that specific platform to lie about her, then you can use your platform. About anything. Oh. What she said, she said. I never took anything that she said out of context. Yeah, it's not worth She it. said what it's she not said. Definitely. Great to see you. I'm okay. I just, I just, I just needed him to know where I stood. I wanted to go over there and but well, you might handle it. Yeah, I appreciate you. Don't waste your time. Whatever happens, we win. Because what I come out of this with is more ammunition than I've ever had. Now that I know the truth and the insights of this ugly machine, I think I can not only be an effective legislator if I get in, but I can be an incredible support and ally for people who want to put themselves through this hell going forward. What are you doing on election day? I'm making phone calls all day. You've been calling, making phone calls all day? All day. Excited? Well, now I guess no, I'm not excited. I'm not. Okay. I'm just... Just trying to hang in there is what I'm trying. All right. To do. Oh, wow. And excitement isn't a part of it. <laughs> oh my God, you look so nervous. Stop it. <laughs> so how many ballots got turned in so far for your for this Over district? Over 5,277, wow. according to the last update. But it's more than double what the last two municipal races were, which speaks to, I think, our outreach and, and the candidates that are running. I think it's a good thing. Does it seem like this race kind of got small? It got small and it went places that, unfortunately, but I can tell you, I never felt the need to go or wanted to go. I'm not happy about who I feel like I had to vote for for mayor. I think it should have been Lisa. Just when I started working on this, I kept thinking, oh, it doesn't matter like who wins or who loses. It's still gonna be like this amazing story. But now I really care because I feel like the city of Denver is like losing because they don't want to elect people that care about our most vulnerable members of society. Politics sucks. Like I saw things over the course of almost a year of doing this and none of it's fair. The whole thing is rigged in favor of money and white privilege and white supremacy and just like the power is not there for us and it never was meant to be there for us. And so for me, what Candy and Lisa and Veronica represent is like power and how much we need to have that in all levels of our government. We want a country that we can be happy to pass on to our children and our grandchildren. Okay, so I'm going to vote. <laughs> So you upset everyone quite a bit with your gay <laughs> with your pro-homeless people <laughs> and that's why you got as far as you did. May your legs be replenished from all the walking you've done for freedom. May you be grounded in the love from your ancestors, from your community. May you be cleansed from all negativity that other people have tried to surround you with. May you celebrate tonight. You did that. You have already won in the hearts of so many. There are little black girls, little brown girls who think and who understand, who know they can be leaders because of what you have done. That is a win. May we stand up for me? to sing a song now, everybody. <laughs> Thatcher, you're the best singer. You want to sing a song? What do you want to sing? 
I can break out of my spiritual book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if she bought it. I just have a copy of the book. What I notice a lot about losing. Latinos these days is they like to blame poor people. A lot of And so she was talking about. Well, I'm already losing. You already losing? How do you know? They just updated the results. You're losing? What was it all about? Yet? Uh, yeah, the next count. Um, I lost. I lost. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Seven hundred. <laughs> Hi. Good. How are you? I'm sorry. I put two three so much. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We did everything we could. We did everything we could. We couldn't be done anymore. Losing is the worst, but it's part of it. Everyone wants the top, but none of the growing pains. Thing is, Veronica scratched and clawed for the rest of us for 40 years. It's been a real honor to walk the road with a real civil rights champion. And of all the progressive women that were in here, one won. And I guess that is um, at least one won, and, and I hope she won. You are looking at the next city council. sometimes for hours at a time is right here. When we show up for ourselves, yes. we have power. Yes. Raise your hand. Raise if you your hand. Here. Raise your hand. Yes. It's you. Raise your they say that our supporters are rowdy. <laughs>
think that if Jamie Gillis hadn't had made her like gaffes, as the kids were calling it, like the NLACP thing, if those things hadn't have been in place, do you think she could have won? I think she could have won. Um, she was polling actually ahead of Hancock before the negative campaign ads. So, but I also don't want us to be naive about it. So yeah, she made some gaffes, so did Hancock. The Hancock administration dumped a million dollars the last week of the runoff to run that negative campaign ad. She was the one who got it then. Um, I would have gotten it if I would have been in the runoff. And there's no counter. I would not have had the money to counter whatever they put out against me. We had, second to the mayor, the most individual donations of any other campaign. And we had well over a thousand. We were able to raise close to, I think we were a little bit over 150 or $160,000 and it was, through grassroots donations, none of those um, dollars were really from some big entity. It was from regular everyday people all over who sacrificed a cup of coffee or a movie and instead gave those dollars to our movement. People are viable when we invest in them, and we make them viable by investing in them. Hello. Oh. Oh. Candy and I had a conversation, and you know it was interesting because I was thinking about what am I going to do next, and applying for different jobs and things, and then it just hit me like, why am I not offering my support and services to Candy? Like I'm in her district. We ran together. It's how we met. Before I could get like all of my sentences out of my mouth, she was like, yes, let's do it. Yeah, I'm gonna be her chief of staff and we're gonna be able to do some things in this district that we both have been fighting for for a long time. And we're aligned on all of the issues that put us in the race in the first place. When you guys walk through the building, how does it feel? It's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Like, because they, they don't, don't expect to know, see us. They don't here. even know which way to scatter. It's <laughs> 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 like we don't have no contingency plan for this. Candy, quick reminder: you cannot disrupt yourself right. from the dais. Okay, 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 okay. <sighs> it has my name on it. Candy, it's cool. <laughs> Campaigning is one thing, but we have to really think about what does it mean to lead and uplift an entire district, not just speak to your base of supporters. Part of governing is reaching out to people who disagree with you. It was one of the things that I was a critic of of this administration, that they didn't listen to people whose views that they didn't like. Most definitely, and I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> but I also think in a different capacity, like for me, my focus isn't him. 
My focus is continuing to build power in the community, and that excites me. I feel like we're gonna see you on the national stage. Ooh. I don't know. You know, a lot of people keep saying that and bringing that up, and when I talked about the mayoral race and how hard it must be to craft a message that resonates with such a broad spectrum of interests and desires, that challenge is exponentially greater when you run to represent us at the federal level. And I don't know if our state or our country is ready for the message that I'm willing to carry. I had read something that even though Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez won, there was something like 60-something candidates that were backed by you know, the same organization who didn't win. I think it's important to remember that because this is a process and it's going to take multiple attempts and it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be by the same person, but we have to like keep going and keep building on the efforts, whether that a person won or didn't win, that was still a organization that was built, that was still lots of names in a database, that was still messaging that happened. Like we have to keep that momentum, but I also don't wanna be flippant about it. Like it is hard, right? It is emotionally hard, it is financially hard, and there has to be something inside you that burns within you to keep going day in and day out. That's why I'm like proud of my race. Like I don't have any regrets or angst or shame about my race. I mean like, you know, this, we built power. It's what we set out to do and we're not done yet. We're gonna keep going and it's gonna just take on a new form but the energy is still there. The initial ideas and principles are still alive. It's not that complex. I'm not impressed because we're fell in the test. Folks claiming that they're blessed, but you're looking a mess. I'm in raw, keep a watchful eye in my eye. What you do when the dark comes out on the block? Kids with no place to go, they just roaming. Pushed out from gentrification and zoning, honing on the issues. Get it fixed. Picture the vision. Do you care how they live in? Is your pride a mile high? Hancock, the unforgiving. Forbidden people who treat it unequal. Never in the sequels, this world is pure evil. It's a war going on outside. Face your fear. Lack of humanity damaged us from the rear. We got money for wars, but can't house the poor. Bank accounts galore, hiding billions offshore. Too many rich people making meals. Poverty's profits are deceptive. Now tell us who's a villain. You'd rather see them in golf. I look forward to serving you and hearing from your talking like a toy, y'all wound up. Homeless caps round up on bill from the ground up. A skin to come around. Take it for granted the way you do. We know you. 
So Running With My Girls, we finished the film in uh, 2020. It premiered 2021. And it is now 2023. Dr. Lisa Calderon ran for mayor again in 2023. She again came in third place. She recently just started a new training program for women to, to run for office. Uh, so she's working on continuously like building that army to run powerful women. Councilwoman Candy Sidavaca ran again in 2023. Unfortunately, she was unseated this election. But on the positive note, she's also a new mom and has a brand new baby. So she lost the race, but her baby won. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. Veronica's still working, running uh, nonprofits, saving them, housing, working on you know affordable housing projects. She will not quit. She is just stays stays working for the community. Shayla Richard is continuing to work and raise her son and working on her philanthropy. She's on the board of the new training org, Women Uprising. Chantel Lewis ran for city council and she won. We couldn't be more proud. We couldn't be happier. She's actually my councilwoman now. She represents my district. At the end of the film, it is noted that I said I would never run for office, but I did run for a seat on my on my HOA, and I won my seat. I'm not running for any other office, so please don't ask me that. I am not running for office, and people need to stop asking me. <laughs> it's not happening. Hi, I'm Rebecca Henderson. Thank you for watching my film, Running With My Girls. We would love to hear from you in the comments below, and please hit like and subscribe if you wanna see more films like this from World. We wanna hear from you. Join the conversation using the hashtag, Running With My Girls.